Hi, everybody. This is um, Aaron Murakami with A&P Electronic Media and the Energy Science and Technology Conference. And today is March 26, 2018, about 5 p.m. Pacific. And I have uh, Eric Dollard on the line with me today. Uh, we didn't have uh, enough time to really organize a live call, but um, there are some updates we wanted to put out there. And so we'll go ahead and uh, uh, do that. And then in the future, we'll, we'll definitely organize another call where we'll, we'll invite everybody to uh, ask questions. Okay, so I, I got um, the thumb drive with some pictures and videos from uh, RIGS, and um, in, in there is a series of uh, uh, pictures and some videos. Um, one of the pictures you, you said is an O-carrier system, which is the tall rack, and I'll put the photograph of this you know, uh, while you're explaining this um, when this goes up on YouTube. And it looks like a um, pretty tall, skinny rack, with a bunch of components and all these cubicle little plugins and stuff. Do you want to kind of explain what that is, where it came from, and what its intended use is going to be? Yeah, that's the O carrier multiplexing system. It's uh, terminal equipment that's designed to put uh, four telephone circuits on uh, one pair of wires. So there's two terminals in the rack. One's a high band and one's a low band. So that gives a total of eight circuits. So the purpose of that is to carry the signals from the seismograph mine to the central office in the building in town and then distribute the seismic signals from that point. It's an extremely rare piece of equipment. It was an absolute miracle to find it. In fact, it was kind of funny that uh, not only did it start showing up in one spot, but waves of it came in from everywhere simultaneously. And uh, so consequently, uh, there's a complete end-to-end -end working system potentially available. Of course, I have to overhaul the stuff and what have you. Fortunately, the 80 tubes required were donated by a telephone collector for free. Uh, that was very helpful. So we're still waiting on some racks to come in to, um, to get the stuff solidly mounted here in the building. So what you see right now basically is a mock-up get everything sized, those racks are the ones that are going to go out in the mine. So I can't really wire the thing together or do any of that until the racks end up out there. Otherwise, I'm going to have a, a problem moving all that stuff with the equipment and possibly damaging it. So I think in one, one video um, interview I did with you down in uh, uh, at your shop, it might have been the last time I was there, I think you went into some multiplexing concepts. Yeah, that was and, uh, oh, the carrier. Yeah. That, what was not on? I think that was in the seismic music, uh, musical seismograph, seismograph presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I give the theory behind the, the carrier system and talk. Right. To, think a little about the particular O carrier system. And so this is the. Um, that's what it's going to look like, and then the rack next to it will have all of the the amplifiers and modulators and things that were shown on the bench in the musical seismograph video once the means are available to uh, to fabricate the panels and put all the components in so that the rack beside the you know, carrier that's empty will have all the amplifiers and modulators uh, in that rack. In this O-carrier system, um, you know, when you mentioned, you know, four lines on to one line, so this is like classic old technology used on landlines by like Bell Telephone or something, which is what was in service, what, back in the 60s or something? Or? Yeah, this, this started uh, after World War II with the concept of, uh, of what they called direct distance dialing, which okay. now we take for granted, but, uh, but back then you used to have to have operator assistance to make a long distance call. So the Bell Telephone decided to, uh, to engineer a multiplexing system that was easy to manufacture and very inexpensive that could be widely implemented to bring the cost of, uh, of a direct dialing system down to a reasonable level. And the two species were N-carrier, which was made for cable-type transmission systems, and O-carrier, which was made for the open wire-type transmission. So the open wire ones were, were common out in the desert, and those O-carrier lines that we've salvaged are what we're making the antennas out of. So, so not only are we using the, the terminal equipment 
from an O-carrier system, but we're actually using the insulators and wire and cross arms and the things that you've seen in, in prior uh, videos and, and pictorial representations of what we're building. So basically an entire O-carrier facility is being reconstructed for a purpose different than what it was originally intended for. Right. So if anybody's listening and is interested in learning more about this O-carrier type system and this multiplexing concept, um, that makes up one, um, that's just one small part of uh, Eric's presentation, which is the musical seismograph. Um, I was down there in Nevada probably June, May or June last year, and we filmed that. This is after I picked up at the hospital over in uh, California, and, and we followed, you know, went back to uh, Nevada that that was actually not supposed to be the conference presentation, but because you were in the hospital and and uh, health wasn't up to it, that you weren't able to make it to the conference last year. And so thankfully, we actually had a four-hour presentation to fill the spot, which was very, um, uh, very fortunate. Um, but that musical seismograph, I'll put up a, a link to that for anybody to get that. And, you know, it's not just about the musical seismograph. It goes into a lot of stuff, you know, the whole decibel scale and the O-carrier multiplexing concepts, the Tesla converter, and, and, and a lot of different things. Um, but we've received, you know, re re really, really uh, positive feedback on, on that system. And especially, it sounds like, people who you've been talking to who have a background in, in you know, telephone and uh, Bell Lab type of uh, background is really a kind of ecstatic about, about this kind of presentation. Yeah, as a telephone engineer, that uh, that helped get us all set up here and all that, and he got a copy of that. And uh, he's third generation Bell Telephone, and he told me that he thought it was just absolutely fantastic. He had never seen such a lucid explanation of multiplex technology, so mm -hmm. that was quite a compliment. Right. Yeah, and we also show some video of actually going into the mine where you can see the uh, the seismographs, um, all three of them, one for each uh, axis, and. Um, I think that was the first time that's ever been publicly shown. Um, and so um, so the idea behind a musical seismograph and getting the signals from the seismic, uh, the seismographs in the mine to the building, and so what, what everybody is seeing in that picture is a system, is, is a rack of equipment, which is part of the system to transmit, transmit those signals. And so everybody can see that the project is definitely um, moving forward. Um, also, there's, um, uh, let's see, and I'll, I'll edit all these pauses and stuff out. Okay, now there's a, uh, I'll put a picture up here. I think it's called a, is it a TBK-12? Yeah, TBK-12, DV World War II Shipboard HF Transmitter. Okay, and so right now this transmitter um, is being offered to EPD Labs. Um, you know, it, it, the intent is not for it to sit around as a collector piece, but this is something that's going to be able to be um, the perfect transmitter for the uh, telluric transmission system. Yeah, yeah, for the higher frequency version, it's excellent for doing the telluric uh, beacon transmitter that's supposed to be set up here. So there'll be a telegraphic signal sent into the earth around the clock for people to try to pick up with telluric receivers, and then also it will operate a, um, a kilowatt size version of uh, the cosmic induction generator. So it has a dual purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah, this and, is a... and it's also a classic piece of equipment. Uh, and, and what's ironic is, is when, when I was six years old and I received my World War II Navy Radioman's Handbook to start learning about this stuff from... Uh, the TBK-12 transmitter was featured in that book, and in my uh, early childhood, it was always a dream of mine to uh, have one of those, and I always had fantasies of finding some glom pile with one in the corner, which, of course, never materialized. But now that I'm at the other end of my life, the thing materializes. So there's kind of an interesting voodoo with that. Yeah, it's really uh, a rare piece of equipment. It's um, it's a beautiful piece of equipment. You know, it just needs to be cleaned up and I'm sure tuned and refurbished a little bit. But it's um, yeah, if you search online, there's almost nothing that comes up for it. But I'll put a couple pictures of the transmitter, the plate, and 
you know, some of the tubes inside. I have a handful of pictures um, of it. And so since this is being offered, it's, it's, not, it's not free. It's going to cost shipping to go um, across the country, and it's also very heavy. And so um, if anybody can help out uh, with some funding on this, probably about $2,000 would do it. That would help pay for the equipment, um, you know, which would really be kind of a, um, uh, an incredible deal for EPD Labs. As you know, we're operating on a low budget um, and have been for quite some time. But $2,000 would be enough to pay for the equipment and also um, help with some of the shipping costs. And there have been uh, a couple other people who have volunteered to put some money in for the, for the shipping and handling uh, to get it to uh, Eric's shop. And so um, if you can go to um, ericpdollard.com in the right column, there's information on how you can donate. Uh, for one, there's a PayPal button, and if you click that, you can donate directly through the Internet. Um, also, there's an address for EPD Labs at a P.O. box in Spokane, Washington. And if you send a check there, you can write it to uh, make it payable, checks or money orders, make it payable to EPD Laboratories, Inc. And then as soon as those come in, I'll forward those to the bank uh, to be deposited. And so, again, we're looking at about $2,000. Anything anybody can pitch in would, would be absolutely incredibly helpful at this time. Um, anything else you want to mention about the TBK-12? Or do you, can you elaborate a little bit on the, um, the Telerik transmission project? Yeah, it goes down low enough in frequency. It bottoms out at two megacycles. So, so one of uh, my objectives here is to set up the uh, – Tesla transmitting coil, kind of like a miniature scale model of Colorado Springs operating on that frequency. And then I have uh, two very, very large water tanks buried in the ground outside the building that uses the ground electrode. That's one of the things that made this particular building so valuable. And also I have a terminal into the, uh, the prehistoric uh, gas lighting system here in town, which is now thoroughly abandoned and very little evidence of which also serves as a ground electrode. So the whole idea is to send the, um, the longitudinal current into the Earth at one of those frequencies around two megacycles that we've been planning upon and start the, uh, the first regular Telluric broadcasting station for pretty much just Morse code at this point. And if it looks like it gets around, then as things improve, then there will be informational uh, Morse code broadcast, like I used to have at Landers, once there's enough data coming in from seismic uh, equipment and all that, like I had at Landers, it used to be what I called the automated telegraph, and that stuff would be sent worldwide uh, twice a day out of the station back when it was operating. Okay. And the other uh, aspect, like I say, is the cosmic induction generator. Yeah, so the cosmic induction generator... Um you know, out of a lot of the videos that I have on YouTube, right, which there's, there's quite a few, that, um, that video talking about the cosmic induction generator when we were all down there and I think Paul Lukowski was there and you were there and, and those experiments were being done on the back bench, that video I think almost might, might get more views than any other video because of the interest, but also it gets the most ridiculous comments that people are commenting on about free energy and all this other stuff saying, oh, you know, this is a big scam and there's no free energy. And it's like th these people are not even reading or comprehending the fact that that has nothing to do with the purpose of the machine. No. And so, you know, there is CosmicInductionGenerator.com, I believe, which is a presentation that John Polakowski did about, I don't know, four, four conferences ago maybe and um, four or five conferences ago. And, uh, you know, he had the demonstration going on in the back room and kind of gave a talk on it. Do you, do you want to give a little basic explanation of what the cosmic induction generator is and how this ra radio transmitter ties into it? Well, basically, it's two, trans two Tesla transformers connected back to back so that they just transmit into each other, which produces a push-pull arrangement. So... This MWO configuration is basically the same thing. It's a version of the cosmic induction generator. 
if, if it's wired in the balanced method versus yeah. the right. So now the reason why this got called the cosmic induction generator is this actually all got started in uh, a friend of mine in Bolinas when he was in high school. Uh, we converted his bedroom into a laboratory, and then uh, it was kind of an interim period. My laboratory in San Francisco was destroyed, as they always are, and uh, so RCA set me up with some more materials, and we put this little thing together, and we started doing some experiments with uh, what I just learned about Nikola Tesla and some things that I discovered independent of Tesla on my own, and uh, found that the, we built a little kilowatt transmitter and that the discharges off of this, uh, this setup of transformers were like totally organic and uh, exhibit the property of being self-sustaining. There was a situation where when we used the disruptive discharge mode that, that neon tubes would stay lit after the power was turned off and they would stay lit for a long period of time and they seemed to contain an amount of energy that you could extract, which I thought was rather fascinating. What, what was it that kept the neon tube lit? And then the, uh, the life form patterns that were produced with the vacuum tube method and spectral uh, colors that were not identify, identifiable with any elements known. So it, it really uh, seized my attention. At that time, uh, I started getting some light bulbs, some other things, and that's when like some of the pictures that are, that are still available, most of the pictures have been lost, but that's when we got the galaxy in the light bulb, which is something that only happened once right at the beginning, but uh, we got a complete galaxy, just like some picture you'd see on TV, a deep space inside a burned-out streetlight, which promptly exploded violently, even though there's supposed to be a partial vacuum in the ball. It did not implode, it exploded. And uh, at that time, I was reading a book by Wilhelm Reich called Cosmic Superimposition, and that's when the name Cosmic Induction Generator was coined. Because in his book, the way that he talks about the uh, genesis of cosmic formations uh, was very akin to what was going on between the coils. So when I engaged in the, uh, the attempt to complete the Integratron after Van Tassel died, a larger unit, asymmetrical unit, was, was built there, just a, a one-ended deal, and... Uh, and a lot more light bulb pictures were taken, and then the thing was moved to Santa Barbara, and a 5-kilowatt version was set up that, uh, that produced some absolutely stunning displays, and it's possible to modulate music onto it. So when you push down on a key on the keyboard, uh, this large uh, discharge would burst forth from the output terminal and the coil with the music coming out full fidelity, and quite loud, about 90 or 100 decibels. It actually uh, it frightened some people away. But as the story of my life goes, all of the video documentation for that vanished. So I can't show anybody that. And then the, uh, the funding for the lab was uh, embezzled, and uh, it all vanished to the winds, uh, now, the story of Eric's life. Now, when you say the galaxy appeared in the bulb, and, you know, many People have heard this before, and you've explained it to me, and it's basically a plasma-type light that was swirling in the shape of a galaxy, right? That well, what it, what it is is, um, is, the, um, is certain elements in the, in the gases that form in the bulb when it gets hot. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it seems to be if the ions are metallic, uh, they establish their own boundary conditions something which these fusion people have been, you know, battling with with all their mega buck, mega kilowatt, mega whatever atom smashers and all that have never been able to achieve with all their magnets and lasers. They can't do it, but we did it in a, you know, high school uh, kid's bedroom on his workbench that he built in wood shop with junk parts from RCA, and we actually got uh, plasma containments. Uh, the plasma containments were multiple and of various sizes and uh, a plurality of little stars and suns and globules and all that started to form in the bulb until uh, 
there was literally thousands of these things of all different colors and shapes, and it produced a, a spiral nebula that looked exactly like a galaxy with right. thousands of little stars and, you know, and larger globules and it, for all practical purposes was a galaxy and it produced so much etheric force that it actually uh, exploded the bulb and in, in later experiments it was found uh, even though we could never get a pure spiral nebula somehow that one bulb was the only one that did it but we'd still get many discharges which are still available on photographs on the internet uh, the rather remarkable situation that when the bulb exploded, uh, the plasma inside still maintained uh, its condition and would exist for a couple of seconds after there was no more bulb to contain it, which I thought was quite fascinating. And uh, one person in the room ran in sheer terror uh, when that event happened, and we never saw him again. <laughs> yeah, one of the other... Um one of the most ridiculous comments I see on that cosmic induction generator video on YouTube, one of the top comments that people post is that um, they think when you say a galaxy in a bulb that it's a literal galaxy is what you're claiming. <laughs> well, I mean, what, you know, who knows what it is. Maybe it is. So. But, uh, but I'm not going to make that claim. But, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, 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 is this is a living energy. Yeah. So, in a sense, it is a real galaxy. But not in that, you know, that maybe it contains, you know, inhabitants and, right. you know, and, and stuff like that. But then, you know, we're getting into an episode of The Outer Limits here. I mean, after all, it was The Outer Limits that gave me a lot of inspiration when I was a child to get into this stuff. But, uh, hey. but I, te I tend to stick more to, you know, what I can actually measure and, uh -huh. and, and what have you. But, but it is a fascinating idea that, well, maybe, you know, on one level it is a galaxy. And so la la last year when there was the big uh, eclipse, um, I went to Rigby, Idaho, and um, there was the Philo T. Farnsworth Museum uh, right there in town. And inside one of the rooms, you could look into, there was like the little containment type vessel for the Farnworth fuser. And so the, what you're experiencing in a bulb sounds like it, you know, I think we've discussed this before, is that it's somewhat related to the Farn, Farnsworth fuser, isn't it? Or, yeah, well, that's, uh, what, that's what endeared me to the Farnsworth family, because when, uh, when the inventor's wife and her son, Philo Farnsworth III, who was a good friend of mine, came into our, you know, little makeshift laboratory in Bolinas. Uh, she was blown away that, you know, that here, you know, these, this kind of makeshift, uh, you know, dirty, you know, environment made of junk and, you know, struggling to get enough power through the little power line that comes into a house, was doing the same thing that her husband had struggled for decades to produce. So at that point, uh, all the information on that subject and whatever materials were still surviving were immediately made available to me, and it was quite an educational experiment. experience. Mm -hmm. That's how I learned about the multipactor and, and a lot of the interesting things that Philo Farnsworth was working on. He's probably one of the greatest geniuses of, uh, of that period of time, but unfortunately, like Tesla and most of these people, because of the dictates of capitalism, they would never write books or make that information available so people could understand it. It was always hoarded, and they, they died in their bitterness with it in their head for no one to ever mm -hmm. know again. And, and what was her son's name, Philo's? Philo Farnsworth III. He was the third, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now with the, um, you know, the topic of the telluric, transmission and the whole earthquake um, forecasting system. Recently, when you were at Riggs over there in uh, California, um, you all set up a miniature little small-scale receiving system. Can, can you kind of paint a mental image of kind of the block diagram of what components are together and how, how it's all connected and, and what it's doing? Yeah, it's in its most basic form. So basically, um, it's two ground rods separated at a great distance from each other, 
and then that goes into a, uh, a network that uh, basically is just like a little transformer and a filter. And then so we have, um, we have two 1,250-foot lengths of field telephone wire that go out to, uh, to distant ground rods in kind of a triangle. And each of those ground rods is on one side of a, of a geologic formation driven into the roots of very large oak trees to get a, a good connection into the earth. And then the, the slab of rock in between the two gullies that the rods are in kind of acts like the, uh, the inductor to draw the lines of force in. Then that connects to a, uh, a telephone repeating coil through a, um, a network to... Uh, to keep the lower frequencies in the DC out of the coil, then that connects to a 1,500-foot-long shielded transmission line that goes back to a building, and then that goes into another repeating coil, and then a network uh, designed to get the Navy 25-kilocycle uh, transmitting station out of the signal as much as possible, because that tends to burn out the speakers and the audio amplifiers and drive the the dogs and cats insane. And then that goes into the microphone jack of uh, a recording studio preamplifier, and that goes to a power amplifier, uh, which drives a speaker. So it's really a very rudimentary setup, but now uh, the person that owns the property is an electrical engineer, and he understands all this stuff, and, uh, and he leaves it on with the oscilloscope and everything 24 hours a day. So when anything gets ready to happen, he's going to know about it. So basically, as crude as it is and as, you know, the waveform faithfulness and interference and all the other situations that normally require the use of an Alexander antenna don't exist. So there's a lot of hum, a lot of interference from the Navy and what have you, but, uh, but it provides a usable output. Is that something that you would encourage others to build yeah I mean, basically on it's, that just, it's just uh, two ground rods that go to you know an audio transformer like a microphone microphone the line transformer and then mm -hmm. from a line the microphone transformer and then that goes into the audio amplifier and comes out of the speaker the only complexity is is the networks required to uh, to null out the uh, intense power line interference which basically is going to make it particularly with this new NEMV energy that's being introduced into the power system now, the power grid, as I think people have heard me talk about before, is being turned into a giant jamming instrument with massive proportions, uh, multiple megawatts. So, so most people, will, well, it, it's, it'll be impossible to receive. It's the same situation we have here because of this uh, ridiculous power situation that... Uh, that the power line interference is 10 million times stronger than the signal we're trying to pick up. So yeah. to do to do a um, a direct ground rod to ground rod type of reception situation here uh, would be futile. Well, but if you go into somewhere else, like let's say over there by Lone Pine, where you have the LA Department of Water and Power, which I think is the last sensible utility company on the planet even though they're, they're starting to slide too, uh, there's absolutely no interference whatsoever, even though the power lines are, are only 1,500, 2,000 feet away. Mm -hmm. So it shows you the difference. So in this case where, where we set up this deal, it's a, a large piece of property surrounded by other large pieces of property. Uh, the power lines... The DWP is 4,800. In this case, they're 12,470, but they're connected to a grounded Y transformer. Even though there's no neutral and the loads are all delta, it's still produced a massive quantity of interference on the overground. I was surprised that just grounding the neutral of the substation transformer can cause such a massive increase in interference. But in the ground, because it's a delta-connected load, uh, the interference mostly comes from loose connections and people's circuit breaker boxes or illegitimate ground rods put in on the neutrals of outhouses and stuff like that. So, so we found, we put in three ground rods to get the direction of where that current gradient would be the least, and that nulled a lot of it out, and then put in a, a high-pass network 
at the sending end to get rid of the uh, basically the three predominant components, 60 cycles, 180, and 540. 540 you've got to kind of live with, but the 180 and the 60, uh, those aren't necessary. And then, um, then from there, uh, then it goes to the uh, to the, where the receiving equipment's at, and then you have to have a filter to get rid of the 25 kC. That's the next major interference source, and that one's really strong. So the thing is, it's not just a simple matter of sticking some ground rods in the, in, in the ground and connecting it to an audio amplifier, because all you're going to get is a massive blast of hum. Mm -hmm. now the, now the, reason, the, reason, the reason for using the Alexanderson antenna is twofold. For, one thing, it's got a flat frequency response so that you know that the waveform you're looking at on the scope is accurate. It's faithful to what's actually going on the ground. The other thing is, is the phasing of the Alexanderson antenna is such that it receives radially from the center of the Earth outwards and not transversely uh, along the ground. So most of the power line interference flows along the ground but the Earth signals are 90 degrees radially out of the inside of the Earth, so the Alexanderson antenna can allow to another 10 or 20 dB of rejection against the power line interference. And that's a more, much more complicated array. But we didn't have time to fool around with that. The objective was to get something on the air as fast as possible. Uh, this was a, uh, the interference in this area is acceptable, and... Uh, and the telephone company, GLOM, was available. The repeating coils and the, the capacitors and other things that we needed. The same guy that provided the tubes for the, uh, the O-carrier provided us with other components, and we got it working. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a, around a half a mile of line or a little more. Yeah, um, well, there's uh, uh, 2,500 feet in, you know, the the radials that go out to the ground rods, and then there's about 1,500 feet of shielded transmission line that uh, that goes back to where the receiving equipment's at. And does it is it ideal for it to be like all in a straight line, or no? It's not as long as the two ground rods are far apart from each other. Mm -hmm. So that way, then you know you have a distance. Right. So that basically defines a straight line because you can draw a line between the two ground rods. Uh -huh. Now this, you know, the concept of the earth signals coming from below moving up, um, now, now there's a, like an electric field, you know, between the earth ground and the ionosphere at, I don't know, three, 400,000 volts, depends on whose book you read. Um, it varies. Yeah, and it'll change. It's yeah, it's always changing. Yeah, cut maybe a couple hundred volts. Uh, the, the, the good weather to. The engineering too. figure is, is 300 volts per meter. That's a nominal value, if I remember right. Yeah, and it can go five figures in lightning storms, and oh, depending yeah. on weather right. and, and that and that kind of thing. And so, is it possible for the Earth signals to like pluck those? Um, electric lines in a way to where you could monitor it like, like a capacitor or something? Yeah, that, that's, it, part of, that's part of the system I had at Landers. Okay. So there's two components. There's the overground and the underground. And ultimately, you know, they share with each other. Mm -hmm. So now if there's a, a major current generating event going on in the earth that produces, uh, you know, like these earthquakes – before the earthquakes or during them and what have you, you can get currents, you know, many millions of amps, is that generates an image current in the ionosphere. So the ionosphere itself is, is in some ways also uh, a mechanism for forecasting earthquakes, but there's so many other influences on the ionosphere, it's best just to use it as an auxiliary signal. But at Landers, it was all coupled together into, into one system which was stereo, in that uh, the overground signals were on the right-hand speaker and the underground signals were on the left-hand speaker. And when things got all stirred up, it made some rather remarkable sounds. Okay. The, um, 
Now, when Riggs was there at the shop, um, he took some video of you in your office, kind of going through some explanations of uh, some stuff in some books. Well, and that's, uh, also that, what that is, is, the, um, is I was uh, showing what's going on with this, these, this book that I'm writing now, which I'm up to about 1,200 pages. And, and I'll probably make that, that a book, that, Yeah, that book is uh, it's an extension of, of the presentation I gave called um, uh, The Extraluminal Transmission Systems of Tesla and Alexanderson. Yes. And that the, the bulk of that presentation was just discussing the concept of transmission in general so that it would be possible to understand the details of what made Tesla and Alexanderson and Marconi's system different from each other. So what I'm doing now is, is, uh, is I'm continuing and thoroughly covering the entire uh, subject of, uh, of electrical transmission, wireline electrical transmission from, uh, from beginning to end. And I'll probably make that a separate video. Otherwise, it'll make um, what we're talking about on this call. And if that yeah. this came at the end of it, it'd be a little bit long. Right. And so, um, so we'll definitely. Well, yeah. Put so what I do is I show you know what what it is that that I'm getting into. Uh, it develops the whole uh, Faraday Thompson theory of the ether, mm -hmm. and then uses that to uh, to provide the uh, the theoretical basis for resistance and inductance and capacitance and all those kind of things. And then once all those uh, terms are developed, then they're applied to the transmission line. You know, how does the transmission line respond to DC? How does it respond to AC? How does it respond to impulse currents? How do standing waves come about? Uh, it's basically a, a, a completely thorough textbook on the process of uh, electromagnetic transmission uh, through wire-type waveguides or transmission lines. Mm -hmm. Probably the most thorough one that's ever been written, and of course, a lot of the material, the foundation of it, is all either from Steinmetz or J.J. Thompson's uh, master books, which I think I show in the video. Yeah, there's a big green one. Yeah, that's the J.J. Thompson, and then there's another big one that I've been working on now for about 30 years, and that's the Steinmetz uh, transient book. Mm -hmm. So I always use those as the as the basis for developing all, you know, the further algebraic representations and what have you. The, the whole work is, is, is purely algebraic, so there's no real complicated mathematics or anything that, that can't be understood. It's all basically just high school algebra. There's a lot of it, but, um, but it's not difficult. Okay. And a lot of diagrams. Yeah, so if you all want to see that, I'll, I'll, um, that'll come shortly after uh, this video is posted on YouTube. I'll have to put all that together. It's like five or six clips. I've got to now, string I think together. Have, I think you have some of those notebooks already on the Internet somewhere. Um, you, for, you mean from Volume 1? Yeah. Yeah, Volume 1. I think it might be on the extraluminaltransmission.com. I'll, I'll have to double check, but that's the whole first series. And some of that J.J. Thompson stuff you actually touched on towards the end of... Uh, uh, the power of the ether as related to music and electricity. Yeah, and that's that's part. I'll pick up on that again in the next presentation. Okay. So that the next presentation will pick up where that one left off, kind of. Right, and, and on the uh, for the conference presentation, I updated the uh, title of uh, the talk. Do you want to you want to give that title? Uh. The history and theory. The, the history, theory, and practice of electrical transmission and distribution. Yeah. So a, a lot of that will be extracted from the uh, from the material that we're talking about right now, but it's still it's still in the primordial stage. I'm not you know I'm not quite certain exactly how, what, or why, or whatever. But but I'm going to get into a, a lot of the uh, of what's going wrong with the power grid today because that seems to be a topic people are very interested in, uh, the various things that disrupt the power system and how they do it, like the solar flares and nuclear EMP, uh, the things that tend to generate interference, uh, the, the things that have to be taken in consideration for you know, safety of the public and property and what have you, fault current protection and transients and, and all on, you know, Pretty basic level. I'm going to try to make this one 
a little more, uh, or I should say, a little less mathematical, but but that's pretty hard. Yeah, I also present some of my uh, Versa algebra material in there uh, for the first time. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there anything else you want to cover? I think that's it. Any of you? Okay. I'm not certain. Okay. Now I do want to mention that um, you know, as everybody knows. Uh, we've been paying on this building um, for a few years now, and fortunately, um, with some of the donations from uh, a few people who made some sizable donations in addition to the collective smaller donations, that the balance on the mortgage for the building is only $5,800. And so if there's anybody that can help um, uh, donate any funds to help uh, pay that off, that will relieve about a six hundred or so dollar a month um, uh, monthly payment from EPD Labs, and uh, that would make a huge difference. And so, you know, if somebody wanted to pay off the whole thing or or just donate some, it's only fifty eight hundred. There's um, at ericpdollar.com in the right column. You could donate either by PayPal or you can donate by check or money order and send it to the EPD address uh, at the Spokane P.O. box. And as soon as that comes in, I, I'll just send it to the bank. And um, But we'd like to definitely have this have this paid off as soon as possible just to relieve that, that monthly payment. And so, you know, starting at, I don't know, 70000 plus or whatever, and it's only 5800 right now, that's definitely, uh, you know, huge progress. And so, again, if, uh, if anybody can help pitch in for the, the TBK-12 uh, Navy radio transmitter being offered to us, um, that's going to be used for the Telerik transmission system that Eric talked about. And also, if you can help pitch in for the um, 5800, uh, this would help things out a lot. And also, these donations are tax deductible. Um, EPD Laboratories, Inc. is a 501c3 charitable uh, nonprofit organization, and so um, uh, they're all ta tax deductible donations. And uh, do you have any final words, Eric? No, I think we pretty much covered everything. I'm sure there's something, but I think uh, we talked about what we wanted to talk about. Okay. Mainly the the fact that now we've got something on the air 24 hours a day with a competent engineer listening to it. So that's a big step forward. Right. And, and I mailed you to Lone Pine um, copies of the um, notes that have been transcribed from Volume 1, uh, vo actually Volume 2, um, just to see if we're on the right track with that. And as soon as you okay. look those over, I'll get with Simon. And for everybody's information, on the Eric, Eric Dollard thread at energeticforum.com, um, uh, Volume 2 is going to start being transcribed and, and posted there for free, so you can kind of follow along as it as it's being done. Well, actually, we have a lot of catch up to do because Eric's you know probably on Notebook 15 by now. But in any case, um, yeah, uh, about, th those are going about, to be posted. Uh, let's see, I think it's uh, um, 900 pages in the volume two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and oh, every massive. day, every day, another couple of pages. So it's mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. It's just I just don't sit down and write it. First, you know, I gotta. I have to take the stuff out of the Steinmetz book or Thompson book, and the dimensions are all screwed up, and the typo errors, and uh, and the stuff's not derived, and and I got to work through that. That's about two weeks, and uh, then there's usually about maybe 300 pages of notes out of that. And then that distills down to 15 or 20 final pages. And that whole process takes about six weeks altogether on about, you know, half-time basis. Slow process. But, right. uh, but the stuff that I'm learning is so fascinating that, uh, that it gives me the inspiration to keep doing it. And that's something I'm kind of lacking on right now is inspiration. But... Uh, but when when I get a hold of something and it starts uh, starts becoming fascinating, then that keeps me going. Okay. Well, anybody listening to this on YouTube, um, you know, thank you for your interest. And and again, any donations um, will help out a lot. Just go to Eric P. Dollard, 
com and in the right column you can donate by paypal or check or money order and um i guess we'll we'll schedule another live call where we can bring people on to ask questions about um you know any any of the work that's been put out so far and until then we'll uh, we'll be in touch soon that, that next give me a call next time you're uh, you get back to the shop okay okay later. all right bye. thanks a lot eric okay yeah. bye